Welcome back friends. Uh, we are continue with our discussions on strategic issues in services marketing. So far we have talked about managing demand and capacity, another important issue of yield management and as I had mentioned in my concluding remarks in the last session, whatever you may do with managing demand and capacity, there could be situation when demand is less and there would always be situations also when some sort of waiting will become inevitable. Again, try to think yourself as customers of services. Try to think in terms of queues at railway reservation, queues at airports, queue at um, hospitals, queue at ticket counters of um, movie theatres, some sort of waiting at restaurants, waiting at amusement parks. So, waitings are part of service industry. Now, what do you do as marketeers? How do you manage those waitings? Now, there are different strategies available to manage those waitings. So, we'll begin our discussion on managing waiting lines. How, as marketeers, you can devise strategies to manage the waiting lines. First and foremost, try to find out why these waitings are taking place. That means you employ operational logic. Is there something lacking in our operations that this waiting is taking place? If that's so, try to modify that. Number two, you establish a reservation process so that waiting can be minimized. You pick up your phone, ask, for, ask the doctor for an appointment at a specific time. You are given a specific time to come at the clinic or the hospital. So with the reservation process, you can reduce the waiting time. Again, it doesn't mean that there would be no waiting. Even after you have fixed up an appointment with the doctor, say for example at 2.30, and suddenly there is an emergency case may have still have to have waiting or the doctor has given you a time for 2.30 assuming that each patient would take 10 to 15 minutes whereas the patient who has gone just before you, the doctor has taken 30 minutes with that patient. Still waiting may be there but the, these are strategies to reduce waiting time. Total elimination of waiting time may not be possible. Third strategy, one I talked about applying uh, operational logic, having a reservation system. Third is you differentiate between different customers. And how can you differentiate? You can differentiate based on the importance of the customers. Your regular customers gives, gets a preferential treatment, maybe other customers do not, or depending on the urgency of the job. For example, at hospitals, you don't have a common queue for OPD and emergency. It's not like that. Emergency is separate and normal OPD is separate. Or depending on the duration of a service transaction, those who require a bigger sort of a larger service, maybe a different waiting, those who require just a smaller thing, in the modern retail outlets you might have seen certain queues only for customers who have five or less items in their baskets. For example, I, have just, I want to just buy a loaf of bread, few eggs and butter. So I would not like to stand in a queue for 15-20 minutes wherein people are buying 20, 30, 40 items. So there could be a separate queue for people who have just two, three, four items. So there could be different waiting strategies for different people like that or payment of a premium price. So th that's the hard reality of the market. Money talks. So, in airlines, a first class passenger, no queues, maybe excellent lounge, and he doesn't have to stand in the queue. While the economy passengers, maybe for them there is a queue. So, that's another way. And lastly, despite all this, try to do something with managing perceptions of waiting. That means making wait a fun. Of course, that, sound, that sounds a bit um, optimistic. So, if you can't do that, at least make it tolerable. You try to make waiting at least tolerable if you cannot make it fun. So, if you, if you see the basic strategies which I have told you of managing waiting lines, broadly I can divide it into two. One is operations management. That means something you are doing with your operations so that waiting is reduced. And second is the perceptions management. Even if you cannot do with the operations part, you can do something with the perception so that though actual waiting may not have reduced, but the perception of waiting by the customer is less. How can you do that? Wherein a 10 minutes wait does not appear to be 10 minute wait to the customer. And again, let me tell you that researches have shown that higher the weights, 
the perception of over exaggerating that weight is there. For example, a two minute weight may be perceived as two minute weight by the customer, but a ten minute weight may be perceived as a twenty minutes weight. A ten minute weight customer, I have been standing for long, whereas actual time has been ten minutes. You might think I am standing there for last fifteen, twenty minutes. A two minutes, you may think, okay, I just came, just two, three minutes, okay, fine. But a 10 minutes wait may look like a 20 minutes wait. A 20 minute wait may look like a 30 minutes wait. So that, that's the perception. How do you manage perception so that that exaggeration in the mind doesn't take place? How do you do that? For that, you have to understand the psychology of the customer. How the customer behaves. What does he want? How does he feel about different things? That you have to take into account. And based on that, you have to develop your strategies. Now, what do customers think about waiting in line? W number one and the most important one, unoccupied time feels longer than occupied times. If a person has nothing to do, is standing in a queue, that wait seems to be a bigger wait as compared to if he has something to do. That something can be just watching television or in a doctor's place, some magazines are given. If you are going to a dentist, some material related to dental care, he goes through that, those sort of things. So now good movie theaters, you will find at the ticket counters, there would be TV monitors installed. Why can't we have similar TV monitors at say, railway reservation counters at smaller places? Possible. No huge investments are required. But the perception of waiting by the customers may reduce. Pre-process waits feel longer than in-process waits. When the customer thinks he's already in the process, the wait seems to be lesser as compared to that he has not just entered the... For example, when you are visiting a doctor, you are asked to fill up a form, you feel as if you are already in the process, though you have actually not met the doctor, but you are not feeling that you are waiting. So the pre-process waits are seem to be longer than in-process wait. Anxiety makes wait longer. So if the people are placed comfortably, they are not anxious, at times you think you are forgotten. It's half an hour we have been standing in the queue, no one bothers about us, I don't know what we will get, whether we will get the service or not. Anxiety makes wait feel longer. If during that time there is some provision that these people can sit, they are offered, okay, let's not talk of a glass of juice, just a glass of cold water. Someone comes and gives them a glass of cold water. At least they know, okay, there is something, someone to care about us and we are in the process and we will get our turn. That anxiety will be reduced. Uncertain waits are longer than certain waits. If you are told, okay, doctor is in emergency, it will take an half an hour. That half an hour spending may not be that troublesome for you. Contrast it to the situation, no information is given to you. You are called at 2.30. It's now 2.45, you start seeing your watch, it's now 2.50, 2.55, you get anxious, you get restless and you get a sense of being say, cheated. I was called at 2.30 and no one is there. Same thing if you are told in advance, that sort of problem may not take place. Unexplained waits are longer than explained waits. If delays are there and it is told, okay, because of fog or because of this technical problem, these delays are there, it will be taken care of, that's one thing in case of airlines. And if you are not told anything, then see how your perceptions are. Unfair weights are longer than equitable weights. If you know, okay, this is equitable weight, there was an emergency, the doctor had to go, there are other 10 patients waiting, everyone is waiting, your turn will come maybe half an hour later, not at the scheduled time, you are still ready to accept that. And suddenly you see someone who was not in the queue, he comes and straight away he goes to the doctor. Now you get restless. That this is not equitable. I have been waiting here for 30 minutes and here is a person who comes and straight away he goes inside. That's, that, that's the customer's consumer psychology. The more valuable the service, the longer the customer is willing to wait. As I have given the other example of a retail store, if you just want to buy a loaf of bread, you are not ready to wait for 20 minutes in a queue to make the payment. You will maybe put the loaf back in the racks and come out. Whereas if you want to buy the uh, complete ration for the month, all grocery items for the entire month, you have to spend 2,000 rupees, a full trolley, you don't mind spending 15 minutes in the queue. And solo weights seem longer than group weights. A person standing alone 
seems to be having a longer wait as compared to people who can interact and sit in a group talk to each other. Now considering these factors, psychological factors which customers have in mind, as marketers what strategies can you frame? Some of the strategies which as marketers you should frame are first and foremost you determine the acceptable waiting time for your customers. Now again here some segmentation can be done. There can be a group of customers who are willing to wait for a longer time. There are a group of customers who want immediate service. Now as marketeer, don't think it in terms of a problem. Think it in terms of opportunity. Time is money for many. So those who cannot wait, maybe a premium product for them. Charge higher prices. Those who can wait, a different product. But for that, you have to have different segments. You have to know how different segments behave what sort of acceptable waiting time is there for each segment. Try to install distraction that entertain and physically involve the customers. It could be as simple as putting up TV screens uh, or during the waiting lines, putting up a magazine, some other information, uh, maybe some other entertainment kayak sort of a thing. If we, some service involves children, it could be some, some interactive games. A touch screen system wherein mm, children can just, in, outside a restaurant, can just play. Again, as marketeers, it could even provide you an opportunity for additional resources. It can even be priced if uh, children are really interested in that. So just a small amount. So while children are waiting, they are playing. For them, in certain cases, may be more enjoyable than the actual service inside the restaurant. So do, don't think in terms of just the challenges, but the, these would basically provide you opportunities, not only to retain customers, but also to have additional revenues. As far as possible, get customers out of line. For that you can have different queuing arrangements. Maybe you are, once you enter, um, uh, for example, in a thing like railway reservation also, there could be a sitting arrangement. Once you enter that particular building, a token is given to you. And then you sit. So as and when your number comes, your token, that number will be displayed. So it's not that you are standing in a queue, you are thinking the other queue is moving faster, your queue is moving slower. So even deciding on what sort of queuing arrangement, that's also a decision to be taken. Modify your customer's arrival behavior when the customers would be arriving. Again, you could provide incentives for people to come during off-peak hours. And keep resources not serving the customers out of sight. That, that, that's one area which marketers lose sight of. Again, think yourself as a customer and then see your psychology. For example, you are visiting a bank branch, you want to take out money and there is a long queue. And at the same time, you are seeing at some other counter, a person has no work to do. He is just having a cup of tea, the bank employee. Now that creates a sense of frustration. Here are customers who are standing in queue for a long period of time and here are employees who don't have anything to do. Though that particular employee may not at all be related to retail banking or face-to-face -face banking with the retail customers, but the customer is in sight of that. So those resources who are not serving the customers, keep them out of sight of customers. Otherwise, customers may have negative feeling that the bank is not responsive to the needs of the customers. Now, I'll give you a very uh, simple example uh, how this waiting line thing was managed by an international bank and this data has been taken from an article in a journal and I am giving you just the brief summary of those data. Um, bank of America in United States tried to do this by managing waiting lines and what they did was they put TV monitors where there were waiting lines for tellers. Now before this experiment was done, before those TVs were put, the average actual waiting time was 6.17 minutes. The each customer had to stay at an average 6.17 minutes in the queue. And the customers were asked that how much time did you wait? And the average perceived time was 8.16 minutes. Though they were actually waiting for 6.17 minutes, they thought they were waiting for 8.17 minutes. That means a 32% overestimation of waiting time. Then the bank cam installed TV monitors and after that again they tried to do the research what sort of perception of waiting is there for the customers. 
Now, while the average actual time, they did not do anything with the operations. Operations remain the same. That means you are trying to do something with the perception management. So, actual time was almost the same from 6.17 to 6.14, which is statistically was insignificant. Nothing to do with the operations. They didn't improve upon their operations so that they came down by 3 seconds. Just maybe uh, during that particular time, that was the average. But the important point is, the average perceived time by the customers after those TV sets were installed was 7.04 minutes. That means an overestimation of just 15%. So when the customers had nothing to do, they overestimated the waiting time by 32% of the actual one. And when they had some distraction, the overestimation was just 15%. The, the, these are the brief uh, results which I am... I have just called out from that article and showing you. Of course, Bank M did further research also that based on this, what would be the different the difference on customer satisfaction? And they empirically worked out that all the investments made in putting up the television sets would be recovered in less than two years. Because of the improved customer satisfaction, which would move, mean improved customer retention, which would mean more customers stay with you, they provide you more business and in service industry which works more on word of mouth than on advertisement, more satisfied customer would mean more new customers. So even that sort of empirical research can be done. So by doing simple things and now again, don't try to think it as a problem, try to think in terms of opportunities. When you have installed TV monitors and you are showing something which distracts the customers, at the same time you have got a captive audience which can be used to show commercial advertisements. So you can use it even as a resource wherein you show advertisements and that can be a revenue generator also. So try to think in terms of challenges as well as opportunities which this give. So uh, we were talking of more customer satisfaction, better quality of services which lead customers to stay with you, bring in new customers with positive word of mouth. Which brings us to the next important issue the strategic issue in marketing of services that is service quality. This is one area in which lot has been worked in the last two decades especially. Starting with 80s, 90s and now also lot of work is being done on service quality. I'll just give you a working definition. Again, I don't say that you should go in for definitions. But just a working definition, just to appreciate what we mean, service quality as perceived by customers can be defined as the extent of discrepancy between customers' expectations or desires and their perceptions. This is one of the definitions given. Some other academicians have defined service quality as the delivery of excellent or superior service relative to customer expectations. Another Academician has defined quality of service as perceived by the customer is the result of a comparison between expectations of the customers and his real life experiences. Again, no need to just cram or remember these definitions. Try to go into the concept or philosophy of these definitions. Essentially, what the quality is, is what the customer thinks or perceives it is. Customer thinks he wants something and then he evaluates what he is getting and then he judges whether it is quality or not. So no need to have uh, big management jargons or big definitions of what quality is. Quality is what customer thinks is. So basically you have to try to find out what customers want. That is quality. Now different people, different academicians have provided different theoretical frameworks different models of understanding what service quality is and what are the different bases of service quality, how do you frame your expectation, how do you judge as customers the quality of service of a particular provider and I will be discussing two broad schools of thoughts. One you can call it European or whatever given by Grunrus. Grunrus gave a particular service quality model and another model which has been given by academicians from United States Zethamal, Parshuraman and Berry. Those who, uh, these three have worked a lot and their model now has become one of the most prominent model being used in service quality. I will be broadly discussing these two models of service quality. Coming first to the Grunros model. What the Grunros model says is that the customer 
perception of quality depends upon one expected quality and on the right hand side the experience quality what the customer expects and what he thinks he is getting a comparison of the two is the perception of the quality if that is so then we have to go a little bit deeper into that how do customers frame their perceptions how do customers frame their expectations let us take the left hand side first the expectations now try to think yourself as customer of a service you want to make use of a telephone service you want to subscribe to be a mobile service company or maybe you want to make use of um, educational service or you want to make use of a bank on what basis do you frame your expectations one could be your needs that's what i want these are my expectations fine another could be a word of mouth my friend told me this is an excellent bank so my expectations from the bank would be higher another could be communication by the service provider the restaurant advertises great ambience excellent service a smiling service so naturally your expectations go higher that's what the provider is saying so i should expect that so th these are some of the things like customer needs your word of mouth or marketing communication or image of the organization based on which you frame your expectations and your perceptions on what you are getting are based on two things that, that's what grundro says and that's the core element of grundro's research grundro says in case of services the customer judge ju the quality of the service just not on the basis of what is being delivered but also on how it is being delivered the what part the outcome part he terms as technical quality the how part or the process part he calls it as a functional quality hospitals technical quality is cure functional quality is care now think yourself as users of health services of course the cure part is absolutely important for you but no less important is the care part how you are treated legal services not only the judgment given by the judge that's important for you to judge the quality of the lawyer okay that's the most important one but equally important is how the lawyer treated you whether you had enough confidence in him whether the appointments were kept in time whether the things were explained to you in detail those sort of things and given the today's competitive environment technical quality is more or less accepted to be there technical quality in case of an airlines safe and timely transport that you expect from all airlines it's not that only good airlines will provide you safe transport if an airlines doesn't provide you safe transport doesn't provide you timely transport sooner or later it will be out of business and in today's competitive environment it will be sooner than later so when technical quality the outcome is more or less acceptable in case of services the customers put more focus on the process part the how part and apart from these two grunus also suggested that image of the organization plays the part of a filter if the organization has good image and something small goes wrong maybe you tend to think okay this is an aberration it will not happen again you try to overlook that an organization which has a bad reputation bad image and something goes wrong it may be magnified so image tends to play a role of a filter good image errors may be a little bit say, reduced bad image even small errors can be magnified so what grunroot said the important part in grunroot's model is that the customers judge quality on the basis of not just the outcome but also on the process how the services are delivered and image of the organization plays an important role another research primarily which was done by parsimonal zethmal and berry on expectations as you'll see in this slide that when we talk of expectations it's not that just one level of expectation customers may have different level of expectation and they say it could be the highest is the desired level that's what i wish for and the lower end is the adequate because desired or wish for may not be available okay i am ready to be except this is particular level of service is acceptable to me this is the minimum level beyond which i am not ready to accept 
but I wish I get this one. So in between the two is the zone of tolerance. Anything in between you are ready to accept. But again, since competitive forces are playing, so where you are in that zone of tolerance as service provider and where your competitor is, that becomes important. And second important point which as marketers you must always take note of that expectations of the customers are never static. Don't think today we have found out that's what customer wants and based on that text five years you're going to design your services. No. The expectations of the customers are dynamic. So you have to dynamically be in touch with the customer so that continuously you know about customer expectations. Because customer expectations depend upon customer needs which may change the word of mouth which may keep on changing, the image of the organization may keep on changing, your marketing communication keeps on changing. So how, how do you think that expectations will remain constant? So expectation will also be dynamic. So you have to dynamically, continuously find out customers expectations and try to be as nearer to the desired level so that customer delight. Nowadays people say satisfaction is not enough. You may have customers who are satisfied but still they may leave. So customer satisfaction is not enough, you have to delight the customers. And you have to see how competitors are doing and as compared to that, how you are doing. Now the other research which I talk of, Personal Raman, Zethamal and Berry, they said that customers judge the quality of service on a number of parameters. And they identified few parameters and finally bunched them into five specific categories. And these five categories are, number one, reliability. Reliability is ability to perform the promised service dependably and accurately and according to them this is the core, the most important attribute. Unless you are reliable, you cannot remain in business. Second is responsiveness, which is willingness to help customers and provide prompt service. So managing waiting lines falls in this category, whether you are responsive to customer needs or not. Third dimension is assurance. Assurance is employees' knowledge and courtesy and their ability to inspire trust and confidence. Assurance will be more important in complex services, especially in services wherein you don't know what's going to happen. For, for example, health services. You're not sure, but unless you have confidence in the doctor, you may not go to him. So assurance becomes important. Empathy, that is caring or individualized attention given to customers. And finally, tangibles, the fifth one, which is appearances of physical facilities, equipments, personnel, and written materials, essentially the physical evidence. What sort of physical evidence are involved? In services, for example, you don't know anything about, physical evidence may become the most important cue. A place you are not aware of, you, you have gone out on a tour, for example, from away from your hometown, and you want to have food. You don't know which restaurant is good. Maybe you tend to go by the physical ambience. A good looking restaurant, hygienic restaurant, waiters with good uniforms, those sort of things will make definitely a difference in the way you take the decision. In certain cases, physical evidence may be least important. But in certain cases, physical evidence may be one of the most important factors while deciding on patronizing a particular service. Now the next model which I am going to discuss is the GAPS model of service quality. As I said earlier, I am discussing two models, one given by Grunros and the other one given by Parsanaman, Zethmal and Berry. Before I discuss that model, appear seemingly if you see the slide, I want that slide to be shown just for 10 seconds. If you see the slide, it appears to be a very complex model. So I will not straight away tell you what it is, I will explain to you what this model is and then maybe that slide would make sense to you. Now start, we start with the basic thing that as a customers you expect something, the expectation and you think you are getting something, the perceptions. So that means there is a gap between expectations and perceptions. So this is the customer gap which as marketeers you have to bridge. That is your challenge and this model revolves around different ways of how this gap can be bridged. This is what the customer wants. This is what he thinks he is getting. The gap in between, that's your challenge. How to bridge that gap? One way is you can do something with the expectations. You can do something with the perceptions also. That's the important point to note. It's not that just perceptions can be done. Even expectations can be managed. So how do you bridge that gap? 
to bridge that gap you have to know reasons why those gaps exist what could be the possible reasons first and foremost unless you know what the customers want how can you provide him that particular thing so first and foremost gap would be not knowing what the customers want whether it is because you don't go in for a good marketing research or whether your frontline employees are not trained enough to give you a good feedback or whatever the reasons. Assuming you know what the customer wants, but they have to be translated into specific customer related specifications. Customer wants no more than five minutes waiting. So that should be your standards. Unless you have standards which are translated from customer expectations, you can't deliver a service as per their expectations. Okay, let us assume you want, know what the customer wants and you have also put in specifications as per their needs. Still there could be a gap between your standards and what you are actually delivering. What could be the reasons? You have put in certain standards which are in line with what customer wants and still you are delivering something else. Reasons could be one could be the topic of discussion in the first session. Demand. High demand service quality is affected or not training people lack of good strategies for human resources management so even if you plan for standards you are not delivering that could be another reason for the gap and final gap the fourth gap which they say identified was a gap between what you are actually delivering and what you are communicating to the customers while your standards may be the 10 minutes waiting and if you communicate to the customers no more than five minutes waiting naturally there has to be a gap that means it's essentially a gap between operations and marketing marketing says something else through advertisements and operations is doing something different uh, the service factory floor so unless these four gaps are bridged the customer gap cannot be bridged so this is all what this model talks about so at the first glance this model looks to be complex but things in terms of breaking it into different components I'll repeat it this model talks of a customer gap the gap between what customer think he wants and what he thinks he's getting the challenge to market is to bridge this gap and for that he has to identify the reasons for this gap first of which is not knowing what the customer wants second is not translating those expectations to standards third not delivering as per those standards and fourth a mismatch between delivery and what is being communicated if the, these four gaps are bridged the customer gap will automatically be bridged so for that you may be requiring marketing research feedback from frontline employees the top management commitment proper human resource policies including selection recruitment training all those sort of things managing demand and a synergy or coordination between operations and marketing so that, that's why when we talk of services marketing, services marketing is essentially not just marketing. It's basically a trinity of marketing, HRM and operations. So in certain institutes the course is called services marketing and management, not just services marketing. So essentially even when we talk of services marketing, it's a trinity of marketing, operation, HRM. And if you look towards the extended marketing mix element, when we talk of people, we are talking of human resources. When we talk of processes, we are talking of operations. So even services marketing, we are talking of human resource management and operations management. But why do you go for service quality? Because costs would also be involved in service quality. Does it result into benefits? Yes. But there are even empirical researches done how service quality results in financial benefits the next model it's not a model actually but just, just to highlight to you how service quality results in better financial performances the improvement efforts would result into service quality improvements now service quality improvement definitely would result into better perception of service quality and customer satisfaction which would moon customer ret retention greater revenues and profitability that, that's one sequence but just, just don't think in linear terms service quality improvements can also result in cost reductions which would be helpful in reducing profitability, improving profitability. Similarly, when a customer is satisfied, not only he stays with you, 
but he spreads a positive word of mouth. And as I said earlier also, in services, customers tend to rely more on a word of mouth than on mass media. That means a satisfied customer spreading a positive word of mouth would bring in more customers. So better service quality would result in reduction in costs, the customer staying with you, and through positive word of mouth bringing in more customers. All this would result in greater market share and profitability. Please bear in mind, word of mouth is of extreme importance, is crucial, is critical in services marketing. How many times have you gone to a, watch a movie because your friend recommended it? Just remember it. How many times you visited a doctor because your neighbor or someone who had gone there recommended the doctor to you? When deciding on a school for your kid, you don't look on just the advertisements in the newspapers. Maybe you talk to 10 people. That's how you decide on the service provider. So in case of services, word of mouth is more important as compared to mass media. Advertising, of course, is inform important for informing customer. But essentially, customers would base their decision more on word of mouth. And that's why re customer retention related to service quality, customer satisfaction, customer delight, everything is linked. Uh, briefly, I'll provide you an example of how a particular organization went ahead with its service quality initiative. It's a small case. Given in your study material also, I'll just highlight in a couple of minutes what exactly was done. Implementing service quality initiatives is not simple. You require full-fledged effort, top-level commitment, commitment from all employees. It's easier said than done, that we want quality service in and just there's a magic wand and it will be done. No. What sort of efforts are required? Just by this particular case, I want to highlight that. British Airways, when they started their turnaround, they said we'll focus on service quality when it was in the verge of privatization in mid-80s. And what were the, some of the programs they took? First was putting people first, wherein all the employees were underwent training program so that their skills are improved as service providers. And all their employees, sound, sounds to be a simple term. At that time, British Airways had 29,000 employees. And all 29,000 employees underwent that particular training, including the CEO. He also underwent the training, and that also shows the commitment of the top management, that they are committed to service quality. That was one program. Sounds like just one program. But see the amount of efforts required, amount of commitment required, amount of resources required. Another initiative they took was customer first teams, wherein employees in small groups were encouraged to give their ideas, how to improve customer service. And through this, they received hundreds of suggestions out of which many were actually implemented. The employees and especially the frontline employees are one of the best sources of market information, what the customers want. Third initiative which they did was titled A Day in the Life. This particular thing is very close to my heart also. It basically was meant so that each department each particular section tells others about what they are doing. Basic purpose was that service output doesn't depend on one or two sections, one or two people, one or two groups. Outcome of a service is dependent upon a teamwork. And unless you appreciate each other, unless you appreciate what other is doing, you cannot have that approach. If you are limited to just what you are doing, you tend to think, I am doing the most important job. The company depends upon what I am doing. If I don't do it well, company suffers. If I do it well, company makes profit. No. I will go to the extent of saying, in a service provider, especially in high contact services, even the security guard who is standing in front of the main door or the main entrance, that's also equally important because that is the first contact point when the customer comes to the service factory. He may even ask that security person something about the services and if he's ignorant or, okay, ignorant also is acceptable. If he's rude to talk, just try to think of the perception of the service. Or he comes in touch with a particular, in a bank, particular person who is making him the payment. For the customer, he is the bank. That bank may be hiring a lot of MBAs and having very good resources. But for that customer, that particular service provider is the bank. 
So each link may be as the normal saying, the weakest link is the strength of the chain. So each and every department, each and every person, each and every section is equally important. Unless you appreciate that, it doesn't work. And another thing was, another initiative was managing people first, which was basically meant for middle level managers to train them as to how they should handle, how should they motivate, how they should train their subordinates. These were, I am not saying these were the exhaustive list. These were some of the initiatives taken by the airlines based on their focus on service quality and this resulted in a turnaround for the organization. And I will take an example from the airline industry only on highlighting the importance of customer retention. As services marketeer, I have been repeating in this session also, an earlier session, retaining your customers. Your customers stay with you. That's very important. And I'll give you one statistics which highlights how and why retaining customers is important. If this slide can be there for a little bit longer period of time. This, these are actual figures. And I have taken these figures from the Southwest Airlines. This is an airline in the United States. And these figures, they are given in their newsletter. And this is one of the airlines, maybe rather just um, out of, say, two or three airlines at the most, which have remained in profit throughout their inception. This airline is in inception, is in operation for more than 30 years, more than three decades. And in all the years, they have been making profits. And in one of their newsletters to their employees, they circulated these figures. Very interesting and just try to see the importance of customer retention, importance of individual customer. This data relate to a particular year. I have not given the year. In that particular year, total profits were $179 million and total flights flown were 624,000. Which means on each flight, the airlines generated a profit of $287. So one flight generating a profit of $287 and average one-way fare of that airline was $58. So 625, 625, uh, 6,25,000 flights in the year, each flight generating $287 as profits and fare for each one-way flight was $58, which means five passengers in each flight. This $287 are being given by five passengers. The bottom line which the airlines highlighted to its employees. I will read it out specifically slowly. Bottom line is only five customers per flight accounted for total profits. That means to have lost business of only one customer per flight. If all the flights which are flown in the year, if you lost just one customer on each of that flight, meant 20% reduction in profits. If at an average you would have lost five customers per flight, that's all if you had lost, your entire profits were wiped out. That highlights the importance of customer retention. And very briefly, in services, why customers are profitable over a period of time, just few points I'll mention and I'll conclude my presentation with that. More profitable because there are increased purchases. When customer stays for a longer period of time, he tends to purchase more from you, he is more confident. Profit from reduced operating costs, generally it is said it costs five times more to attract a customer than to retain him. You don't have to spend too much on um, promotions. Profit from referrals, that is through a positive word of mouth and profits from price premiums. The more a customer stays with you, the more you know about him, the more you know about him, the more customized offering you can make to the customers. And if a customer thinks that he is receiving a specialized or customized offering, he is ready to pay you a premium price, which the competitor cannot ask because he doesn't know you that well. So knowing the customer well, you can tailor make your product based on his or her requirements for which he is even willing to pay you a premium price. So that highlights why retaining customers is important for service providers, importance of word of mouth, managing demand and capacity, and issues related to service quality. That was our basic areas on which we had a discussion. That's all I wanted to discuss today. Thank you so much. And I hope this session would have been more interactive. Thank you once again.